Hello and a very warm welcome to Bharata First. You're watching Frank Talk. I'm Frank Rausen Pereira. First, let me inform you about Bharata First Knowledge Center, an initiative that will help each and every one of you transform the way you learn. You can go to our website, kc.bharatafirst.com, for more details. Let me tell you that it's going to be a learning experience like nothing that you've seen before, and it will change the way that you gain knowledge and prepare you for life ahead as well. Register now and avail the limited period early bird discounts. Again, kc.bharatafirst.com is where you need to go to get more details. Since you're here, I would like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs a daily big picture quiz. Please do participate by going through uh, the description in big picture videos. Now, here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. I need it now more so than ever. In case you have trouble with UPI IDs, you can click on the payment link in the description box and follow the steps. All this information along with some must-see recommendations are in the description of the video. Please go through it. And now on to the program. Well, with the media reports stating that the union government will not uh, be taking measures to bring back the four Kerala women who left India to join the Islamic State with their husbands and are currently lodged in jail in Afghanistan, the families of the women have expressed disappointment with the government's decision. To talk about this issue and how to tackle radicalization, I have with me a very special guest, a dear friend and someone whom I look up to. He is also a well-wisher of Bharata First. It is a pleasure to welcome on Frank Talk, Major General Dhruv C. Katoch, retired. He is a retired Indian Army officer and now director at India Foundation, a think tank. General, welcome. Uh, thank you, Frank. Deeply honored. General, uh, this issue of radicalization, you know, it's not something new. It has been going on for some time now. And uh, string, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about how you know, intelligence agencies need to do a better job in stopping what is happening and all of those aspects as well. But to focus on these four women, especially who, uh, you know, went and joined the Islamic State along with their husbands. They are now in jail after they surrendered in 2019, December. They've been languishing in jail for about 17 months now. The families back home are, uh, you know, lobbying to bring them back to India so that they can be tried by Indian laws. Your thoughts on this entire issue? Uh, Frank, when you look at this particular issue of these four women, there is, of course, if you, you know, there will be a, a group which says there's a humanitarian angle. They made a mistake. Get them back. But you see, I look at it from a different perspective totally. I look at it from the point of view of a larger society and the message which you are sending across. Now, let us say there is a murderer who has committed a heinous crime. You see, he has gone and slaughtered 10 or 20 or 30 people, and then he repents. Now you say, listen, he has repented, let him go. Now, what is the message which we are sending to other potentials? Right, that, okay, uh, let us commit an heinous crime, let us do what we want. When we are caught, we are in a position actually to repent. And then the government will say, okay, let these chaps off. They are going to behave from now onwards. Now, the larger message, I think, is what should concern us, not the immediate concern of these four women. Now, they went across... They had a choice. They made a particular choice. And they must now stand by that choice. When they took a choice to go by the, you know, to uh, pick up the gun, to support the Islamic State, to take part in terrorist activities, then they must bear the consequences of that decision. And I'm afraid the families must bear that consequence too. Because the larger danger is that should you be soft on terrorism now, then it will come and consume the state. Uh, over a period of time, more and more people will be motivated to join because they will have the assurance that if things go wrong, we can always come back. Now that option must be stopped for them. They should. They, it should be very clear. If you go, well, either you will be killed there or you will be imprisoned there, but there is no place for you back home. Now make your choice. And I think we need to give people hard choices, not the soft choices. So I, in this particular case, I would be supportive of the government stand 
to which states no we cannot give them these choices i would like to take your mind back to uh, you see many many years ago that case took place of uh, a murder of uh, the, the children of a um, uh, armed forces and uh, a naval officer the billar ranga case you see mm. Mm. now is anybody would anybody in the right mind say listen they are repented let them go because you let them go instead of these two billar rangas there will be hundreds of them which we will spawn and we cannot afford this in our country which is already in a you know facing very severe, uh, a very serious problems of radicalization so while it is a human problem as far as that family is concerned i think when the state looks at it it must look at it in the wider perspective and in this case i think the decision of the government is correct and we must support it absolutely now since we are here then uh, general a quick follow up question on this particular issue itself you know why is it that so many women are so easily radicalized especially in that belt of kerala you see uh, firstly let us understand what exactly you know when we when we use the term radicalization what exactly are we talking about and i think it is simply a process of getting indoctrinated to a particular ideology that's all so when radicalization is getting indoctrinated to a particular ideology and this ideology could be religious or others or others now how does this indoctrination take place it takes place through a uh, outside source in this particular case it could be family members it could be the husband it could be the brothers it could be the sisters it could be the village it could be the molvi it could be the priest it could be anybody whoever is doing that ideological motivation or it could be self motivation that means now the internet is available and people get on to it they get hooked and they get uh, they get uh, ideologically indoctrinated now as far as women are concerned i think they form a very susceptible uh, a very susceptible group and because they are susceptible you see they are operating in a very closed environment they don't have access to uh, open information let me say so if a woman has come into a particular house and she's been fed a particular ideology day in and day out and she hasn't been given the option of listening to alternate views uh, i i presume in many of these cases even the television is not permitted then over a, over a period of time you get used to that idea and then one there is so much of suppression within you the stockholm syndrome also takes over and you feel that is the correct path you actually fall in love with your captors and you say okay let's go with it and i think um, why this really happens is perhaps there is also a lack of family support as far as those girls are concerned but uh, on a larger plane i think uh, a great deal has to be done by society to prevent the vulnerable sections from getting into this particular trap absolutely you know taking uh, example of these four girls and looking at the larger picture the big picture so to speak general three of these four girls did not even belong to the muslim community uh, they later on converted of course got married and then their husbands took them there but you uh, so when you look at society at large how does this happen i don't because of a lack of a better word i'm going to say recruitment but how how are these people really recruited how do they go about doing this what is the modus operandi really you know i will uh, frank i will deal with this both for men and women mm. now uh but let me start with the women because the, the girls because you started with that now let us say there is a girl from a particular economic background and uh, she falls in love with a boy and she doesn't know who that boy is and you know he's got a motorcycle there's that swagger right and he entices her now there are also organizations uh, which are actually working to convert these girls and the boy uh, who who does the job of marrying her you know he's given a reward sometimes a lakh or two lakhs uh, these are well advertised and these uh, procedures are well known now it is a great period for this girl so long as the romance is on now once the marriage takes place and she is removed from her zone of comfort so to say then the problems start coming in but that is the time when she realizes that there is no other support available and now she is trapped now because yes, she is trapped, just a, sorry to interrupt just a, just a follow up question so would you say that this is all staged in a way till the woman finally falls to the trap Oh yes it is absolutely for a, to uh, let, there are no absolute frank but by and large it is staged to a very large extent it is staged and uh, uh, once that woman is committed now she doesn't have an option of going back to her family she's fought to the family you know as a young girl 
uh, or a, even as a young male teenager, there is that sense of rebellion. Uh, we've all been through that phase, you know, where you want to rebel against authority. And that rebellion is not because you don't like society or something. It is simply to say, listen, I'm growing up. I want to make my own decisions. And if you have a supportive family which actually supports this path, you will find the rebellion is not there. Uh, when I was growing up, you see, uh, you know, you know, in those school days and uh, uh, my friends who were in college when I was in the academy, uh, you, it was a great pleasure to say that, OK, we'll go on strike and burn a bus. Today, when you think of it, we think how stupid were those thoughts? You see, I mean, rebellion has to be or, you know, that sense of self-worth. It has to be cultivated in different ways. And in this particular case, you see, we, the, 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 the child re requires a particular type of support. And now when that support is not forthcoming because she has already crossed or uh, what they, you know, uh, 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 she has already burnt her bridges, so to say, right? And then she doesn't know who to go back to, who to fall back upon. And now because there is no place to fall back on, well, she continues, uh, you know, that Stockholm syndrome again takes over and then she becomes, you know, totally imbued to that particular cause. It works for the men too. You know, for, for, there are many reasons why uh, young boys and all, uh, you know, uh, get in doctor, get uh, uh, caught in this. And please take it from me, it is not always financial. When we had that case of the bombings which took place in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, they were all children of well-to-do families. In fact, they were the, the children of the cream of society. Even they fell. So I think a very great deal depends upon the type of education which the people have re received, uh, the mentoring which they have got, uh, in many cases, especially amongst the Muslims, there are families which say we need to give our child religious education. But when so they get a Malbi. Now that Malbi is not supervised. And that Malbi has got total control over the child in preaching a particular religion, uh, on teaching a particular precept of that religion. And the parents are unaware of what is happening. Now, I think all these are very dangerous things. Uh, in the schools, uh, if you actually carry out a study of what has happened in Jammu and Kashmir, especially in the Kashmir belt, uh, you will find that the madrasas have been taken over by a certain set of radical preachers who are no longer the Kashmiri preachers, the one who uh, preached the Sufi Islam. All of these chaps follow the, the, uh, uh, the Salafist thought and they are from UP and, uh, UP and Bihar, uh, or very, uh, most of them rather. So you are finding that the mosques have been taken over by a particular type of, uh, by a particular uh, ideal, ideological group. The schools have been taken over sim similarly. So you will find that even the teachers, uh, the teachers, the school curriculum, etc., is all uh, has all been aligned to a particular ideological thought. And this is uh, this uh, this is something which needs to be break uh, broken if we have to move ahead and prevent radicalization from taking place. Absolutely. So a couple of other aspects, uh, General, uh, where is the funding coming in for all of this? Because if you look at it, uh, it, it, it definitely needs money. You can't go about doing all these things and staging these acts with motorcycles and, you know, showing wealth and so on and so forth without any money. So is the funding coming from outside? Can't we stop it? How, how do we get to the bottom of it? Actually, when you look at uh, what is happening in the, uh, in the Muslim world, uh, this is not to say that Muslims are terrorists or something. I'm simply talking because the, the funding really has a very deep uh, uh, Islamic source. And uh, please relate this to the rise in oil prices which took place in the 70s. And uh, suddenly, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the petrol, which, uh, you know, if you gave a 10 rupee note in, say, in 74 or 75, you could fill five liters of petrol and get 250 back. Now, uh, today, when you're looking at petrol at 100 rupees plus, per liter, you can imagine the change in fortunes of the Arab world which took place when the uh, petrol prices skyrocketed in the 70s. And suddenly they were flush with funds. And it was the, this flush with funds Arab world which really started this ideological uh, brainwashing of youth by sending money uh, to the madrasas and by promoting a particular type of culture, the, the Salafist culture, so to say, now or the Diobandi or the Salafist culture. Now, so the funding has really come from the Arab world. And uh, if you look at what has happened at the mosques which have been created in, say, in many parts of UP and Kerala, see where the money has come from. And the money has actually come from there. It is very difficult to stop this type of funding. Uh, it is coming in small, small groups. And when you say that, OK, we want to build a mosque here, then which government has the power to say you will not build that mosque? So the question is, in a secular country, to prevent that sort of money inflow, I think is a very, very difficult job. 
what of course can be done is to see that the type of teaching which is being given there in the madrasa or in the mosque is controlled the way they do it in singapore uh, you know singapore has got total control over uh, i mean there is total religious freedom uh, nobody tells you which religion to believe in you can follow any faith and there is no bar but they certainly prevent any religion from actually preaching hate and they enforce it now in india it is very difficult to do that so i think as far as the money supply is concerned uh, for the radicalization process it is going to be something which is very very difficult to stop uh, i mean i really haven't been able to figure out how can you tell a particular state government or a particular organization listen you will not get money to build a mosque it is like telling a, a, a christian group you don't you you will not build a church or the hindus you will not build a temple or the sikhs you will not build a gurdwara it doesn't work that way so when these structures are being built i think it is uh, with the where the funding is coming from for building a religious structure from charitable trust from across the world it is going to be very difficult to stop what we can monitor is what is happening inside that group and i think uh, on a larger plane because this is what i also wanted to talk about you know as i made my initial statement uh, radicalization is simply indoctrination with a particular ideology now you want to stop that indoctrination i think you have to start off with our children in the kindergarten schools then in the in the in the primary schools you know then the middle schools and then of course throughout your school curriculum because unless we start with our children unless we start teaching them basic ethics and tell them this and we all as a group of people as a society despite having different caste color race creed what we are all together as one now once that message gets implanted into the mind of a child at an early age it is very difficult for any external force to change that thought you would have you, you would have realized that you know when we are looking at children they are uh, and that child has got a primary school teacher and that teacher has told the little girl something and the parents may be more educated but believe you me that child will actually believe the teacher more than uh, her own parents because that is the aura she's ma'am she's sir you know he's sir so that aura of of the school always remains and that that there is that element of faith now imagine if your curriculum like the way it is in pakistan where they actually preach hate against a particular community right uh, it is institutionalized into their beliefs right from childhood so pakistan is a completely radicalized country today and even today just uh, a few hours earlier we had a talk with some uh, another think tank from turkey and they gave that same observation about pakistan the way radicalization has crept in so we need to prevent that that particular thing from coming into india de radicalization is a very difficult and tedious process but preventing radicalization from occurring in the first place is a much uh, is a tool which i think we should resort to and the key really lies in our education system one and in ensuring that our girl child is educated absolutely you know just a follow up question uh, general on what you just said about you know ensuring that we uh, keep a tab on what is being taught now who's going to do that because it's so difficult for us to do you know the get the basic things right so at what level are we going to go and see you know uh, what is being taught and what is not being taught uh, frank for this i think there's not much of a problem really it is simply checking the textbooks that means the written material must be correct now once the written material is correct if some teacher is going outside the syllabus you see then that is a different issue and i think there are methods by which we can actually isolate those teachers but if the written word is wrong then i think the entire class there, there is a tendency in all of us as human beings to believe what is written so that is why you find when you read something on whatsapp which could be a fake message you know and if it but it it actually conforms to your belief system you tend to believe it is true and you forward it again right that is the power of the written word so i think we should simply have a control over what the what is the uh, content which is there in the textbooks and if that content is okay i think to uh, to about 80 to 90% we can avoid this problem of radicalization as far as the schools are concerned absolutely now looking at the bigger issue uh, general of you know those who have already been indoctrinated and then those who are already here and who are indoctrinating how do we deal with them now you see uh, i think uh, even um, uh, as as a as a question of uh, preventing indoctrination from taking place i think it is very important to send two messages one is a political message and the second is a military message 
And both these messages must be very firm. That means there must be a very firm political military message. And that message should be, you cannot win. We are going to win this war. Now, you see, why do people tend to go on that particular path? Because they have somebody has held the carrot in front of them. Listen, oh, after five years or 10 years or 20 years, you will get this. You will get ABC or whatever. Now, once the people are convinced that that is not going to happen, now that is the, that is the first message which must come, that the state is strong, the, the armed forces are strong, and you will not get away with any of these ideas. So I think this messaging is very important. But along with this messaging, I have always felt is, you see, for the military, it has to be what we call an iron fist in a well-built glove. That means you're dealing with the people should be very, very soft with the masses because I, as a military person, the masses are my support base. So when I'm looking into a mass of, say, one million people, I will say 99.9999% are my support base. Out of that, there may be 200 or 300 people who are off my grid. Now, to that 99.9999%, I must be very soft in my approach. Those people must be aligned with the military thought and ethos. But with that small group of 200, that must be the iron fist. But even for them, there must be a window open. And that is the political window. Now listen, if you wish to change your mind, they're always open to you. So never close a window to people who have, uh, who are, you know, getting indoctrinated or who have to some extent got radicalized. So the political window must always be open. But the firm, but the ultimate political messaging will be this much and no further. That means we are prepared to go up to the Constitution of India. Whatever the Constitution permits, we are prepared to give. Beyond that, there will be no compromise. Now, once people get convinced that the state will not compromise beyond that, but the state will be fair, then I think that is the simplest system to break the will of people who, have, uh, who are getting onto this path of radicalization because now they will see themselves as having an option that there are other ways to do it and there are better ways to do it. So if you can look at a better way of doing it, instead of going through all this turmoil of suffering where you have suffered, your parents have suffered, uh, and uh, your children, our future children are going to suffer. If you look at the Jammu and Kashmir example, I think what we should tell them is, you know, two generations have gone by of missed opportunities. What has happened in the Naxal belt? Two gen in fact, three generations have gone by of missed opportunities. And once that message goes across, you see, it's also a question of shaping the information environment. Have we been effective in shaping the information environment in putting across our point of view as a state that we are a fair state, we are a just state, we operate as per the constitution. Now, if that messaging goes wrong and if people, if people perceive the state to be as ruthless as what the terrorists are, then I think their choices are going to be very limited. So we must give them a very clear choice. Listen, here is a constitution. We will operate by these principles and we will give you what you want. If you want to come across, we'll help you. But there is a line and we are not going to bow down. So with that firm political and military messaging, with a good justice delivery system and with keeping your political door open to all sorts of opinions, all, sh uh, all shades of opinions, I think it is a much easier way to actually carry out to prevent radicalization. And because India is an open society, despite all the problems which you see, you see, despite all the problems which you see, you never find the lid actually exploding the way it does in other countries. So we have, our, you know, despite our, you know, um, uh, our democracy, which appears very loud and noisy and sometimes very uncontrollable, there are a great many advantages because the steam has been let off. And there is always, people always know we can get back. We can get back into the path. And I think that is the door which the political authority must never uh, close. But for the military side, don't let the chap with the gun get away, but be very, very soft on the general population. That is the way I would look at it. Absolutely. And one final aspect that I would like to cover with you, General, is this issue of intelligence sharing and, you know, sleeper cells, because we keep hearing about how sleeper cells are active here and there and everywhere else. Can't we do something about it? And do you believe that our intelligence agencies should share information in a better manner so that we get to the bottom of the problem before it even occurs? Uh, Frank, very frankly, I think, you know, that intelligence has now improved a great deal, including intelligence sharing. 
Now, there used to be a time, and I've seen it uh, when I was practically in service, uh, and I was operating in the forward areas, uh, by which, you know, somebody would come from the IB or somebody, and he would get information from me. And then after two months, I would get the same information from IB, ki, this has happened. So I would feel very proud, ki, okay, what I have said is actually happening. Uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, they are simply echoing your thoughts. So uh, now, we, now, I think uh, the intelligence gathering, uh, our own attempts are far, far better. Uh, a great deal of reliance is being paid on, is being put on electronic means and uh, external and internal intelligence, I think has been uh, ramped up to a very great deal. One of the reasons why I'm so confident about this is that we have, um, uh, you, you know, we have actually managed to put a lid on terrorist incidents over the last, many, uh, last at least uh, five to six years. Now, this is not to say that nothing is happening or attempts are not being made, but I think it's been a very good job. And the problem of having good intelligence and sorting out a problem before it occurs is nobody knows there is a problem. No. So the gen the public will not know. They'll say, "No, you have actually you have actually eliminated something which is very serious." Now I want to give a practical example of this, and here I would like to give the example of the Easter bombings which took place in uh, Colombo and other places in Sri Lanka. Now our intelligence agencies got wind of this, and we gave this intelligence to the Sri Lankan agencies that this is going to happen. These are the target spots, and the Sri Lankans didn't believe us. Of course, after the event took place, uh, it's a different scenario. But the question was, are intelligence agencies new? So they are, they are active. They, may not, they will certainly not be, uh, uh, they will not, not be open about it. Because if you're going to advertise that I'm an intelligence man, tell me, uh, then he's no longer an intelligence man. So to that extent, I think it is, the situation now is far better. But having said that, is, are there grounds for improvement? Yes. And I think there is a great deal which we still need to do as far as sharing intelligence is concerned between the military, our own, the military intelligence services, between the state police and the central agencies. And uh, here I would like to put in a slight word of caution because uh, from what I have seen, sometimes the politics gets in the way. And uh, politics gets in the way because a particular state has got a particular um, a thought process of controlling uh, uh, let us say a, a situation uh, which, uh, you, you know, like a, a left wing extremism, a particular state may have a methodology of dealing with it. The center may have different views. And then you will find that that intelligence sharing gets very um, stratified. And, uh, you know, it, then they will operate in silos simply because the state does not trust the center and the center does not trust the state. And uh, it, um, more importantly, it is also because um, when we are dealing with things like left wing extremism, uh, it is a law. It is a law and order problem, and it comes on this on the state list. It is not uh, on. Uh, it is not uh, the center cannot uh, uh, adjudicate on those issues. So, can it be put on the on the central list? Can it be put on the combined list of both? Uh, that is something, of course, it will require constitutional amendments. But there are political problems, and so long as politics also prevails where each political party is trying to gain the upper hand and they are prepared to sacrifice national interest over their political interests, I presume some part of this will go. But, uh, but I still feel that I, I, I mean, I personally feel that our intelligence agencies have done an excellent job. They continue to do an excellent job, but we need to really ramp it up further, especially giving power to the local police. You see, the best source of intelligence is really that beat constable. So how can we... As, as the state governments really empower that, that police, that the beat constable, because he's the first person who comes to know what's happening in his beat. So can we empower that individual, uh, give him better systems or, you know, a, a better system of sort of passing on information, uh, of uh, looking into the information which that particular person has gathered? That is the first step. And I think if we have to revitalize something, let us revitalize at the very first step, the beat constable and his role in the policing system. Uh, I think that would be a very good first step. Frank. Absolutely. General, a pleasure having you on Frank Talk. Thank you so much for joining me on the program and sharing all your views and perspectives with us on this very crucial and important issue. Thank you, Frank. For me, it's been an honor. Thank you so much, General. The pleasure and honor is all mine. And before I go, let me inform you about Bharata First Knowledge Center, an initiative that will help each one of you transform the way you learn. You can go to our website, kc.bharatafirst.com for more details. Just go there, register and avail the limited period early bird offer. 
it will really change the way you gain knowledge it will prepare you for your competitive exams and for life itself go to kc.bartafirst.com and register now once again thank you for your continued support for those of you who haven't already subscribed please like the video subscribe hit the bell icon and then all notifications do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content the bharata first team runs a daily big picture quiz please do participate by going through the description in big picture videos here are the upi ids for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute a small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content so do continue to show your love and support i need it now more so than ever in case you have trouble with upi ids you may click on our payment link in the description box below and follow the steps all this information along with some must see recommendations are in the description of the video please go through it that's it from me see you again next time